Good afternoon and welcome to part three of our six part series that we have called the emerging new era for non-competes and trade secrets. My name is Joyce Ackerbaum Cox and together with my partner, John Siegel, we co-chair Baker Hostetler's non-compete and trade secrets practice team. Our segment today is going to be led by Tiffany Miao, who's a commercial litigator in our New York office and Leif Sigmund, who is an intellectual property litigator in our Chicago office. Couple quick housekeeping items. We're gonna keep the program to 30 minutes, try to keep on time, get you guys in and out of here. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A box. We'll do our best to answer them either during the program or follow up with you thereafter. We do offer CLE for several states. In order to get that, you need to make sure you complete the brief survey afterwards and indicate what continuing education uh, requirements or states you're seeking. Uh, that will be found in the brief survey link. And again, going forward, we assume that our participants and those of you that are joining us have a basic knowledge of non-competes and trade secrets. So we're gonna stay out of the basics and kind of talk about what we view as important trends and legal developments. So turning towards our presentation today, uh, I think in last month's webinar, we covered the Defend Trade Secrets Act, the DTSA. Today, we're gonna talk about the extraterritorial actions under the DTSA, as well as trade secret actions that are brought in the United States International Trade Commission with a focus on enforcement against foreign entities. So let's start with this, uh, Tiffany. Can you just briefly explain to the folks online how the DTSA can be used to bring a lawsuit in the United States for trade secret misappropriation that occurs outside of the United States? Sure. The DTSA draws its authority from the Commerce Clause, and so federal courts have original jurisdiction over cases related to um, a product or service used in or intended for use in interstate or foreign commerce. So to start, a plaintiff, the owner of the alleged misappropriated trade secret, needs to show that the trade secret is related to a product or service used in or intended for use in interstate or foreign commerce. So after the DTSA was enacted, the majority of cases that we saw were really the same ones that litigants would bring under state misappropriation laws. Um, there wasn't much of any uh, litigation involving misappropriation of trade secrets that uh, occurred abroad. But now in just these past few years, we've seen a significant uptick of cases involving extraterritorial claims. And although no appellate court has um, addressed this issue, I think it's safe to say that for now, the DTSA does extend to alleged misappropriation that occurs outside of the US. So in order for a plaintiff to bring such a claim, um, the statute requires that the plaintiff must show that there was an act in furtherance of the misappropriation that was actually committed in the US. And I do wanna make one quick note, kind of backtracking for those that aren't that familiar with the case law, um, analyzing the DTSA's extraterritorial reach, the court in Motorola versus Hytera Communications, a 2020 case out of Northern District of Illinois, um, provides pretty lengthy analysis on this issue. And what was clear to the court was that Congress uh, intended for the DTSA to apply extraterritorially, largely in part because of its concern that in today's globalized economy, uh, US trade secrets can more easily be the subject of misappropriation occurring outside of the US. So Tiffany, what, what constitutes an act in furtherance of the offense committed in the United States that would be the hook for extraterritorial application of DTSA in the United States courts? The DTSA doesn't provide an actual definition for what constitutes an act in furtherance. Um, but the case law on this issue, still very new, suggests that there's kind of really a rather low bar to satisfy this requirement. Um, for example, in the Motorola case that I just mentioned, the defendant had hired engineers from Motorola's uh, Malaysian office who brought with who brought Motorola's trade secrets um, to Hytera relating to digital radios. Hytera then advertised and marketed its version of the digital radios, obviously embodying uh, Motorola's trade secrets, in numerous trade shows in the U.S. So Hytera's promotion of its products in the U.S. was evidence of an act in furtherance of um, its misappropriation. In a situation also common to trade secrets cases where one company seeks to acquire another, um, the diligence process ensues and NDAs are executed, but one company's trade secrets eventually get stolen. 
Um, although the actual misappropriation occurred abroad by a foreign individual for a foreign company, uh, the fact that the underlying contracts relating to like the NDAs were negotiated in the US constituted an act in furtherance of the misappropriation. Another example, regular business trips um, to the United States by a foreign individual who was recruited by a foreign defendant to develop and manufacture products containing misappropriated trade secrets constitute an act in furtherance. And even where a foreign defendant is simply communicating, sending emails, making calls to individuals located in the United States to essentially help keep the plaintiffs in the dark while the defendants are executing their misappropriation, those communications were sufficient to be found as acts in furtherance. And finally, even if you know just simply the use by US customers of products that result from the misappropriation, that has been found to be a sufficient act in furtherance. And on the other hand, there are a few decisions um, that actually find that there was no domestic conduct in furtherance of the misappropriation. For example, if it's clear that all of the unlawful conduct occurred outside of the US, um, and the only thing the plaintiff can allege is that it lost customers as a result of it, that harm, the fact that the harm occurred in the US does not constitute an act in furtherance. Similarly, in another case, um, a plaintiff had evidence that the defendants attended trade shows in the US, but failed to connect or provide any nexus between the, U the defendant's US presence and the actual misappropriation. So what these early cases show is that the domestic conduct must arise in connection with the alleged misappropriation. And notably, the act in furtherance doesn't have to be committed by the actual defendant. What, when uh, plaintiffs do sue foreign defendants for trade secret theft that occurred outside the United States when they bring those suits in the US courts, what litigation problems or issues arise? Well, defendants obviously fight the case. Um, they often litigate and argue that there was no act in furtherance. Um, but now given what appears to be a relatively low bar for that requirement, it seems that defendants are leaning more into you know, other grounds for dismissal, particularly lack of personal jurisdiction, which is related to, you know, which is often related to you know, trying to establish that there were no acts in furtherance. Um, another common ground for dismissal is form non-convenes. And there are actually two cases out of the Northern District of Illinois this year um, where the court denied um, <clears throat> moving the case from uh, the Northern District of Illinois to a Chinese court. So in Invectus versus Shenzhen, um, <clears throat> the court felt, held that the court denied the defendant's argument that the Chinese court was an appropriate form, finding that China was not available um, for various reasons, but including that the, there were travel restrictions in place due to COVID. The court also found that because Chinese trade secrets laws do not provide for injunctive relief in the same way that the DTSA does, uh, it was an inadequate forum. In the second case, um, Phillips versus Bonn, also Northern District of Illinois, um, <clears throat> the Chinese defendant argued that the plaintiffs, you know, they didn't actually bring a lawsuit in their home forum where the plaintiff was a California company with a, its principal place of business in Cleveland, and second plaintiff, the code plaintiff, was a German affiliate. Although neither plaintiff had facilities in Illinois, the court denied dismissal on foreign non-convenience grounds, in part based on the plaintiff's choice of form, finding that a home form for a U.S. plaintiff is any federal district court in the United States. So these cases highlight how it could be difficult to see, you know, how a U.S. court, U.S. federal court. Um, would dismiss a trade secrets case, case on form non-convened grounds, <clears throat> where the only alternative forum being presented is China. But also given the congressional intent for the DTSA to provide global protection for US trade secrets, I think it would be hard to imagine a US court relinquishing um, a case to a foreign jurisdiction with really any less robust trade secrets laws than the United States. Another okay. challenge, oh, sorry, another challenge um, that plaintiffs might or parties might face is related to enforcement. Um, a foreign defendant might not have any assets in the United States. Uh, dif enforcement might be difficult based on you know, the foreign country. And so it's important to sort of guide clients to think about, you know, if even if you can prevail on an extraterritorial claim against a foreign defendant for misappropriation abroad, um, if it's impractical or equally challenging to enforce a judgment, then perhaps litigation doesn't make sense. So given these hurdles, 
you know, and you, you got to bear them in mind if you're going to bring a case. But given these procedural hurdles and enforcement hurdles, what are the benefits to a trade secrets plaintiff of commencing a DTSA action in the U.S. in a situation involving extraterritoriality? Well, for one, the foreign jurisdiction might not recognize the particular, you know, information material as a trade secret, whereas U.S. courts, U.S. law will uh, see, will will find that as a trade secret. Um, U.S. laws also might provide for better confidentiality of trade secrets during litigation. Um, and really also foreign entities can have access to the United States discovery and jury system, which may not be as robust or even available in a foreign jurisdiction. In situations like this, again, it's important to counsel your client, especially if they are a foreign entity, um, about the US you know, discovery system, including the requirement to, of preservation of all you know, relevant material and evidence um, as soon as they are notified of a potential litigation. Most foreign litigants might not be aware of that requirement um, if they're not familiar with litigating in the US. Also, injunctive relief might be a bill in the US that might uh, be more effective, you know, given that the defendant likely sells its products or goods in the US. Um, the DTSA also includes an ex parte civil, civil seizure remedy, um, which could be available, but at the same time, that might be difficult or impossible to really enforce outside of the US. So really, you know, the big takeaway here is the DTSA expands a U.S. entity's ability to protect its trade secrets from misappropriation that occurs outside of the U.S. But on the flip side, foreign entities, you know, those that can survive any sort of jurisdictional hurdles, um, they may also be able to avail themselves of U.S. courts um, to litigate their trade secrets claims. Of course, Parties aren't limited to uh, litigating trade secrets actions in just the US courts. They can also pursue um, an action in the ITC. So that brings us to LEAF, uh, the ITC being the International Trade Commission. LEAF, will you tell us a little bit about um, the ITC and how it works? Yeah, first, um, I think it's important to understand what the ITC isn't and you know what it can and can't do. Um, ITC actions, the, 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 what I'm going to talk about are in rem actions. And so the goal in bringing an ITC action is to stop importation. And that's really all you get. So there's no damages involved and there's no kind of relief for past acts. It's really stopping importation um, of goods. Now, the good news is, though, you don't have to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant because, again, this is a, 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 an in rem action. And really the cases are all about the offending products. So just as an example, um, the names of these cases aren't like Smith versus Jones, uh, but like a couple of examples I, I jotted down, in ray certain steel rod treating apparatus and components thereof, or in ray certain food service equipment and components thereof. So remember the, the, these cases are about the goods and stopping them from coming in the US there are no damages available at the ITC. Now, th th these actions were established by the, this Tariff Act of 1930, and the law was intended specifically to provide a remedy for domestic industries uh, against unfair methods of competition and unfair acts instigated by foreign concerns operating beyond the in personam jurisdiction of domestic courts. So, you know, Kind of following on from what Tiffany said, this is this could be the perfect kind of action uh, when when in personam jurisdiction is is tough to get. We call these three three seven actions because they come under section three three seven of this nineteen thirty tariff act. And the act, big picture, makes it unlawful to import articles into the U.S. that would injure industry or unfairly restrain trade in the U.S., including articles that misappropriate trade secrets. We often hear, and I've, I've dealt with cases where patent infringement is kind of the reason for bringing the 337, but, but trade secrets are also um, a valid cause of action in a 337 action. Now, since Congress delegated a portion of its power to regulate foreign commerce to the ITC, the International Trade Commission, um, that's where you bring these cases, at the International Trade Commission in Washington, DC. Generally, Section 337 claims requiring uh, either an unfair act or an unfair method of 
competition relating to, again, an imported product and where the intellectual property is in question uh, is being exploited by an existing domestic industry. Domestic industry is a big topic in uh, a lot of these cases, whether there is one and whether the importation is affecting one. We could do 30 minutes plus just on domestic industry, so I'll just leave it at that. But this, um, the unfair act or unfair method of competition uh, could be, you know, the sale, um, importation, sale for imp importation, or even the sale after importation of an article embodying um, a trade secret. So all the way back to 1979, the commission has found that misappropriation of trade secrets fall within the scope of Section 337. Um, but again, one of the big hurdles is establishing a, a domestic um, industry injury. So uh, when we're looking at the ITC, what substantive laws applied as to whether a trade secret has been misappropriated? Well, you know what? I, I find that kind of um, an interesting question. Generally, the ITC applies what's called federal common law. Um, so, and, and, and that was established later in the case law. The ITC looks to a single federal standard rather than the law of any particular state to determine what constitutes misappropriation of a trade secret or even what a trade secret is. So they will consider sources of applicable law to include the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, um, the restatement of unfair competition, the restatement of torts, even the, the DTSA, the Defend Trade Secrets Act as, as kind of sources of law. But again, generally what they apply is the federal common law of trade secrets. Interesting. Well, you spoke about the Section 337 actions. Can those be used to cover situations when the misappropriation occurs in another country? Yeah, um, they can. So the ITC uh, determined that Overseas Act of Misappropriation violate 337. Now, um, the International Trade Commission, the appeals court for the International Trade Commission is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in Washington, D.C., and the Federal Circuit has expressly looked at this question as it pertains to trade secrets. And uh, this is the only case name I'm going to give you during my whole talk, but it's uh, it's uh, Tian Ru Group versus International Trade Commission 661 F3rd 1322. That case involved, um, and again, these are all about goods, it involved cast steel railway wheels, you know, like the wheels you see on a train. Um, a company called Amstead was the US manufacturer of these wheels, and they had a trade secret, a way to make the wheels that they licensed to a manufacturer in China. Uh, a different manufacturer in China, the respondent in this case, uh, we, in, in, the, in the ITC, the, what we think of as defendants, we call respondents. Um, the respondent tried to license this technology from Amstead. Well, after failed negotiations, the respondent hired away nine employees from Am Amstead's licensee in China. Um, so we have a situation where, you know, they hired these employees in China. All the misappropriation occurred in China. And the question for the court was, can a 337 action cover actions where, you know, the misappropriation is just occurring in a, in a different country? So in its analysis, the court acknowledged you know, this longstanding principle uh, that legislation of Congress is really meant to apply only when the territorial jurisdiction um, it is the U.S., unless a contrary intent appears otherwise. But the Federal Circuit in this case found that the presumption against extraterritoriality didn't occur for three reasons. One, 337 governs importation of articles into the U.S., Second, the statute's focus is on the act of importation and the injury resulting from the act of importation. And then finally, um, an issued exclusion order, which I'll talk about in a minute, wouldn't purport to regulate foreign conduct. It's only affecting the importation or stopping the importation. Um, so with that being said, the unfair acts aren't, you know, they can't be wholly extraterritorial the misappropriation has to be tied to a domestic industry. In other words, the ITC isn't a venue to litigate claims that have no nexus to the U.S. So 337 can re remedy importation 
into the US of articles that are the product of misappropriation, even when that misappropriation occurs overseas. You talked about these cases at the ITC being all about goods. What can a complainant expect in terms of a, uh, an available remedy in this forum? Yeah, well, and I mentioned it because it, 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 I don't, I won't say it surprises people, but all you're talking about is, is kind of injunctive relief, right? The complainants, the plaintiffs are restricted to equitable remedies. So um, there's no relief for the past and there's no money awarded. So while the case is going on, importation might continue um, and, and there's not a lot, well, there is there is some relief for that, which I'll talk about in a second in the form of cease and desist. So if the ITC finds a violation of 337, the commission will, uh, will fashion like prospective relief. It typically involves the, the commission directing that certain articles be excluded from entry into the US uh, unless and this is another factor we could talk for another half hour about, the commission finds that public interest outweighs the need for an exclusion. So they weigh that as a factor. So as I said, 337 doesn't provide for monetary remedies. It only provides for exclusion orders to prevent the importation of offending goods. And there's two types of exclusion orders you can get, general or limited. Limited is kind of the, I don't wanna say the default, but the one you see the most, but general, uh, directs the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to exclude, exclude all infringing articles regardless of their source, whereas a limited exclusion order directs uh, U.S. Customs and Border Control to exclude infringing articles from some specific entity. Um, in addition, the ITC can issue cease and desist orders against named importers and other persons engaged in what they would call unfair acts. These cease and desist orders would direct a respondent in an investigation to cease unfair acts such as, and this is just one example, selling imported, imported articles out of its US inventory. So if a respondent stockpiles a bunch of product before the exclusion order, a cease and desist order may stop them from selling that off. Um, unlike the exclusion order, cease and desists are enforced by the commission itself and a violation can result in civil penalties, including fines up to, I think it's $100,000. What can you expect if you are um, in this forum as to the pace of a case? How quickly or slowly do these ITC cases progress? Well, you're, gonna, you're not gonna have a lot of nights and weekends to yourself, I can tell you <laughs> that, because the cases go fast. Um, discovery and motion practice happen way faster than a typical federal or state case. And I say typical, I, I know that there's some rocket dockets out there. Um, so it doesn't take long to get from the beginning to the end. Uh, in the procedures, you first get this thing called an initial determination from the administrative law judge. After that, the commission looks at that and issues a final determination. And then there's this period where the president reviews the final determination. So generally, just generally, you get an initial determination in about 12 months and a final commission determination four months later, followed by a 60-day presidential review. So again, it happens really quickly. Just as examples, you know, summary judgment motions, depending on the judge, you might have a couple of weeks to respond to a big summary judgment motion. Whereas, you know, if you do a lot of work in district court, you usually get a lot longer than that. So it's fast. So what would be the benefits of litigating a trade secrets case um, in the ITC court? Well, first, uh, uh, first I won't answer your question. I'll, I'll say the downside is there's no monetary damages, right? But Certainly. you can get really fast relief in the form of an exclusion order and maybe a cease and desist. And you know, that exclusion order can be powerful. Imagine you get an exclusion order so some respondent can no longer in, import something it needs to make its product. Um, so it's a powerful remedy, even though there's no damages. And because these are in rem actions where the goal is to stop importation, there's no question of personal jurisdiction, right? Um, and importantly, and probably the topic that we're covering today, uh, the court has found that it can cover misappropriation, uh, like we saw in the Amstead that, that happened outside the US. So it's a powerful tool, even though no damages. Well, I think that uh, 
both the information that you provided as well as the information Tiffany provided have been very helpful uh, to our audience to understand some uh, different options that they have out there. John? Yeah, and, and look, this is an emerging area that we're going to continue to follow and continue to update our, our clients and friends are as on as these cases, particularly the extraterritorial cases in the district courts, work their way through the system. So Leif, thank you. Very, very informative, very interesting. Most of us have never been anywhere near the ITC. I know you have a great deal, and it's, it's great to hear your experience and your wisdom. And Tiffany, thanks as always. I really appreciate it your presentation. Thanks to everyone for joining us and viewing today. We hope to see you on December 8th for the next uh, session in this series and when we're going to have basically a national tour of developments in state legislation in the area of non-competes. To preview it since the adoption of the DTSA in 2016, 12 states plus the District of Columbia have enacted, in some cases, very comprehensive uh, non-compete statutes and others more limited and targeted non-compete statutes, but we're going to look at uh, the D.C. area, Virginia, D.C., Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, and its comprehensive non-compete and trade secret statute, uh, Illinois, uh, which has a brand new act now, and, and we'll cover the Pacific Rim, California, Oregon, Washington, which is its own realm and region in this area. So, if you have, uh, if you represent a national company, a national employer, come prepared with your pencil and your pad because we're going to give a very fast and detailed uh, national tour on state law developments that you need to know about. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next time, Wednesday, December 8th, 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock on the West Coast. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.